Peter Simonson, Executive Director for the ACLU of New Mexico. Thanks for coming in this week. Well, thank you for having me. I want to start with your reaction to the incident involving Susie Chavez at the Metropolitan Detention Center. You've seen the video. What do you think? Um, absolutely shocking. Uh, you know, the notion that we have people taking care of our um, family members, our friends, uh, in our prisons and jails around the state that could show such, indif such indifference to human suffering, I think is really alarming. Um, but, you know, I fear that it's, it's probably not all that unusual. I suspect something like that happens in some facility around the state probably once a day, if not more. Um, but it's just an indicator of the changes that we need to make in the criminal justice system at large. You know, we see similar sorts of trends happening in law enforcement. Um, I think they're very similar in, in the jail and prison context. Just to clarify for folks, is the ACLU involved in this particular case? No. How does the ACLU track cases like that, the treatment of inmates, concerns about the use of force in jails and prisons? How are you looking for those cases? Well, we receive uh, complaints, written complaints from the public um, to the tune of about uh, 50, 60, 70 a month. Uh, and I would say roughly half of those come from our jails and prisons. Um, there are people who are complaining of situations like the one that happened to Susie, um, but they are also complaining about the lack of proper medical care, the kind of hygiene that exists in those facilities, um, any number of different issues that threaten their welfare. And you know, our organization, um, as much as we try to do, we can only do so much, and we really can't take but a fraction of the most egregious of those kinds of cases, so we're overwhelmed. I think the worst thing about that is that, you know, the, the jails and prisons in the state, particularly the jails, um, are sort of engines of that kind of human rights abuse. Um, we see it all the time. And it's no secret to our legislators, it's no secret to the governor, it's no secret to policymakers in this state. Maybe the general public is not aware, but the rest of the policymaking uh, community is very well aware of that situation, and yet we're unable to, to change it. I'd like to talk about some of those specifics you mentioned. Those are both national and state concerns. Medical care, Corizon, we've covered it here on the show, a health provider at, in jails in New Mexico. There have been some concerns and some lawsuits about their care. What's the ACLU's take on that right now? Well, again, I mean, it's been our observation that regularly people are denied proper medical care for chronic conditions like diabetes, people who suffer some sort of injury and it's never treated and becomes a serious infection and ultimately maybe even results in surgery, um, people who don't get uh, a proper treatment for late stage cancer even after it's been diagnosed. I mean, we're talking about life-threatening conditions that are never dealt with and, and we're not even, we haven't even touched the question of hep C and, and how rampant it is in our prison and jail systems and how the healthcare system in corrections has uh, essentially refused to treat that, that situation. What about mental health care? Just as bad. I mean, uh, you know, I hate to be such so gloom and doom, but we just have to face the facts. Uh, people who go into these facilities with mental health uh, situations, mental health illness, um, oftentimes leave with those conditions having been exacerbated, and God forbid that they wind up in a solitary confinement cell. Um, then you can certainly be, be assured that their situation will only become worse. Um, you know, solitary confinement in our facilities nationally has been shown to be the driver in about 50% of the suicide cases that you see in prisons and jails. It's a serious problem. Um, it's used very liberally in our jails and prisons, um, and uh, we're hoping in the long term to maybe put some limits on that. What about overcrowding of people being put into cells together when they're designed for one person? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a chronic uh, problem in a lot of jails. It was um, the driver behind what happened with MDC and the changes that were made uh, in our jail when it was, back when it was Bernalillo County Detention Center. Um, you know, they, they, they create, they, they are sort of the catalyst for a lot of the problems I see, I suspect. I think um, without excusing the performance of our counties in managing their jails, um, I think they are put under a great deal of pressure to continually receive uh, inmates, uh, people who are charged oftentimes with nonviolent crimes, because at the opposite end, at the policy making end, we have legislators who stake their political careers on uh, a tough on crime stance, um, running legislation that enhances criminal penalties. We have a governor that has bought into that wholeheartedly. Um, and that simply creates this additional pressure on counties to receive more and more inmates for which they have only the same re resources, uh, tax base to try and deal with, and it creates an untenable situation. 
You mentioned a few moments ago that about half the complaints that you're receiving do involve the jails and prisons. How difficult is it for you to get information about what's happening inside those facilities? Is it transparent? Um, it can be very difficult depending upon the facility. Sometimes uh, corrections officials interfere with the mail that comes out of those facilities and would arrive to us. Um, but I would say that the bigger problem is federal law, really. The Prison Litigation Reform Act, which was passed in the, um, at the end of the Clinton era, um, basically put some severe restrictions on inmates' ability to uh, uh, grieve what's happening to them in, to the, in the facility. And essentially what they need to do is first submit a grievance to the internal structure, to the administration, and typically that's denied or the, the, the grievances are lost. And then if they, um, once they're rejected or once they never get a response, they actually have to appeal that result um, and show that they've exhausted that grievance procedure before they can even begin to consider a civil rights lawsuit to protect their rights. And frankly, it's typically better to wait until they're actually out of the facility before they do that. And by then, of course, the damage is already done. Um, that federal law has been one of the greatest obstructions to guaranteeing, I think, uh, safe, safe conditions for inmates in prisons and jails. And do families have the ability to file some of that on behalf of family members who are in I mean, certainly they can be uh, facilitators at some level, but at the end of the day, we need to be in contact with the actual plaintiff in that lawsuit, and that would be the inmate, his or herself. Peter, has there been any positive improvements in this issue in New Mexico in recent years? Boy, I wish I could point to improvements. I think that, um, in general, the Corrections Department has made some improvements around the way that it uses solitary confinement. We continue to have significant concerns. Um, but by and large, I think we have seen a continuing uh, deterioration of the way that inmates are treated, uh, again, as the prison population grows and uh, the counties are forced to deal with a growing, these growing uh, inmate populations. So um, I suspect that we'll continue to see problems and, and also to the degree that we continue to transfer responsibility for holding people in custody to the, to the private sector. Um, a lot of times those private corporations, as you might suspect, operate principally with a profit motive. And so to the degree that they can cut corners in providing medical care, we've been over the last couple, the last dec decade, I guess, we've gone through two different private medical contracts contractors and now we're on our third um, precisely because of the deficiencies in their medical care. Um, you know, that's a situation that uh, I don't foresee is going to change significantly in the immediate future. Peter, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. Peter Simonson also reacted to the news that Governor Martinez will push to reinstate the death penalty for some cases. Go to NewMexicoInFocus.org to see that conversation.